Angela, thank you. For example, we have thousands of early tablets or documents from the Near East, Egypt, China, the Aegean, and the classical world detailing relationships between different sites and regions, as well as aspects of the economy, offices of state, commercial transactions, as well as laws, royal edicts, and public announcements. From the Sumerian Society of Mesopotamia, for example, we have hundreds of tablets from people that list fields, the, crop, the crops harvested in them, craftspeople, and dealing in goods such as grain and livestock. Bureaucrats have always been sticklers for keeping records. At the other end of the scale, in sites left by mobile bands, the only record available is the archaeological one. In living areas delimited by the walls of a cave or rock shelter, the occupation deposits may be deep, built up over centuries or even many millennia. So excavation needs to focus primarily on the vertical aspect, the superimposed layers, and how their contents change through time. On the other hand, open-air sites left by hunter-gatherers tend to be far less substantial, with little depth of stratigraphy, so here the horizontal aspect is the focus of attention, tracing the distribution of fireplaces, other features, and artifact clusters. In rare cases where one can distinguish a single short phase of occupation at a site, it is even possible to gain some insights into precisely what people did and where thanks to the location of artifacts, tool-making debris, animal bones, and so forth. In most sites, however, one cannot distinguish single shore occupations, and instead, excavators recover the accumulated evidence from repeated activities at the site over a period ranging from brief to lengthy and with possible contributions from predators. However, this has never stopped archaeologists from using the wishful thinking for which they are renowned and interpreting this material as if they were all from a single moment, frozen in time, like Pompeii or a shipwreck. In fact, the same is true for sites from later periods. Archaeologists love to conjure up stories to explain the presence and layout of what they find in very simple terms, even though they know that the processes which created this incredibly patchy and imperfect record are hugely complex, complex and usually very gradual. In segmentary societies, survey and excavation are the basic mm -hmm. approaches to locating sites and determining their layup, layout and extent. Usually in a village, some structures are excavated completely, with others being sampled to gain some idea of the range of variation. Are they all similar dwellings, or are there more specialized buildings? Within the houses, it may be possible to recognize areas for cooking, sleeping, eating, etc., and perhaps zoned used by males and by females. The analysis of grave goods or the degree of elaboration in tombs can reveal much about the incipient differences the incipient differentiation in social status in segmentary societies, although it is not always easy to distinguish achieved status from inherited status. However, if children are buried with great wealth, it is a reasonable supposition that they inherited it rather than acquired it. Another major source of information for these societies is their public monuments, such as the causewayed enclosures and earthen burial mounds of Neolithic Britain. For this period of the first farmers, we have lost much of the settlement, but because of subsequent plowing and erosion, by and large, just a few rubbish pits or holes from the timber posts have been detected. But nevertheless, we can gain some insights into certain aspects of their society from analysis of the scale and distribution of their monuments. For example, line draw lines drawn halfway between communal burial mounds, long barrows, divide up the landscape into equally roughly equal territories, suggesting that each monument was a focal point for social activities and the main burial place for the farming community that inhabited the territory around it. It has been reckoned that a group of 20 people would have needed about 50 days to construct one of those long earthen mounds, which seems to have served egalitarian societies. On the other hand, the enclosures, large circular monuments with concentric ditches, seem to be foci and periodic meeting places for a larger group of people, presumably drawn from several of these small territories. Some contain stone axes that come from faraway sources. Each camp required about 100,000 hours of labor, or about 250 people working for 40 days. They made their own entertainment in those days. The long winter evenings must have simply flown by. Later, these camps were superseded by henges, a new kind of ritual enclosure, circular monuments surrounded by a ditch with external banks, which each required maybe a million hours of labor. This suggests the mobilization of large numbers of people, perhaps 300 working full-time for a year or more drawn from a bigger area. This scale of endeavor and the very existence of such major ritual centers seem to mark, seems to mark the transition from the simple egalitarian societies of the first farmers to the more hierarchical chiefdoms which followed. An even clearer indication of the rise of chiefdoms is the eventual, eventual filling of the landscapes around the henges, 
including Stonehenge, the mother of all Henge monuments, which required 30 million hours to build, by circular burial mounds, round barrows, with rich grave goods reflecting the wealth of prominent individuals inside of them. Another approach to studying the change from segmentary societies to more complex systems is through craft specialization. This also exists, of course, in band societies and can be seen in the Ice Age, since not everybody could have produced the finest stone or bone tools or the finest carving and rock art. In segmentary societies, craft production was primarily organized at the household level, and village sites may be found to contain pottery kiln or slag for metalworking. However, it is in the more centralized societies of chiefdoms and states that one can see whole quarters of towns and cities devoted almost entirely to specialized crafts. Stoneworking, potting, leatherworking, textiles, brewing, metal, and glassworking, and such like. Where written texts are missing, as in most chiefdoms, or inadequate, as in most states, the hierarchy of sites can only be deduced by archaeological means. For example, a capital city or principal center can be inferred from its size and from signs of central organizations such as an archive, a mint, a palace, and a major religious buildings or fortifications. It can, of course, be difficult to establish the precise function of large and presumably public buildings, and they may have been multipurpose since temples, for example, can have a social as well as a religious function. But other aspects of cities are easier to figure out, such as the area for specialist artisans or the difference between rich housing and slums. It is an interesting exercise to imagine the city where you live today as an abandoned ruin, with extraterrestrial archaeologists wandering around it, trying to guess what they're looking at. They too would have been able to make some fairly deductions fairly safely, although they might be thrown by bizarre items like photo booths, multiplex cinemas, and laundromats, all of which might look suspiciously like ritual foci. One of the fundamental distinguishing features of centralized society is the disparity between rich and poor, not simply in terms of basic wealth, but also in access to resources, facilities, and status. In other words, in social ranking. As mentioned above, one can easily detect differences in residences and material wealth. In addition, people of high status will usually be depicted in reliefs or impressive sculptures, and of course, flashy burials, as mentioned earlier, are the ultimate status symbol. On the whole, the rich would not be caught dead in paupers' graves. The, conspicuously, the conspicuous display of obscene wealth is not a creation of Forbes or the Tatler, but goes back to the pyramids and beyond. Always bear in mind that Tutankhamun was a young and minor pharaoh. So what must the treasures buried with the great ones have been like? The mind boggles. Where Stonehenge itself is concerned, theories have abundant and changed over the decades. The two current ideas vying for supremacy in the media and the literature are that it was a place of the dead, with numerous burials and cremations centered here, or that it was a kind of lords, a place to which many came for healing. Of course, both of these theories may be true, along with some that are now neglected, and others yet unimagined.